and then we got him more into the costumes because originally I was just saying I'm not I'm not I'm not going to be in a tribute band. No, thanks. <laughs> you know. And then, right, um, right. and then it eventually it was like, listen, you're gonna have to put a wig on, man. It's like they're coming yeah. to hear Bowie songs. Just put a <laughs> suit on and a wig. It's like, oh god. Carry on, carry on till you had and this gone. It's no fun. There's none left. Can we go? Party on, party on, pop along to the song. Sing it loud, sing it strong. Put that on before you go out on a Friday night. <laughs> so here he is, Mr. Steve Evans, another wonderful contributor to the Sonic State album project. So, hi, Steve. How are you? Uh, hi, guys. I'm all right. Thanks. Yeah. So that tune. Now that tune is. It, it's. This is your project, The Girls. Um, can you tell us a little bit about The Girls and how long The Girls have been around and the kind of well, the, girl, the girls, lineup? The girls come from. Um, yeah, we we come from about you know 2002 and um and uh yeah we haven't we haven't done anything for ages and ages and ages but um but uh we still have still have a lot of songs that need recording <laughs> and um and it was a it was a kind of um yeah we we did that i think we did the girls in various guises for about a sort of it was my 10 year kind of 10 year time out in life to, to pursue kind of uh, creative endeavors and and have a party really and um, <laughs> and that was that was what that's what the girls was <laughs> and we didn't do t we didn't do too bad but um but it kind of it, it was uh, it became clear eventually that it wasn't going to bring me the kind of you know wealth and freedom that I, I desired so um, right. I kind of moved on to making records for for other people <laughs> in the end. And I sort of, after carrying one hi-hat stand too many up one too many stairs one oh, night, yes. I thought, I'm not doing, I'm not, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this anymore. We right. Can, yeah, it's time to, time to stop. <laughs> oh, right. So, uh, so the girls then, um, you, you've been the front man and guitarist. Yeah. Yeah. There was, there was we were generally a, generally a three piece. And, um, sometimes my, uh, my brother, Nick, would come and uh, play a bit of extra guitar for us if uh, if the if the need arose but um yeah we were just it was a power trio really but we also mm. kind of used to love um using uh, we go into the studio and do much more ambitious things and then we'd kind of you know be trying to find out ways of playing with backing tracks and things so we could have these full productions and stuff live it used to work really well it was really really quite good fun i was watching the um our farewell gig the other day and there's a there's a great bit at the end when the four of us are stood on stage in animal outfits having sort of performed a song largely through the kind of ear hole of a, <laughs> of a dog head and i'm holding this oh. pyrotechnic device and and the, some colored confetti kind of comes down in front of a bewildered audience and we say goodbye and it's just such oh. a it's such a great moment oh. wow yeah, but it wasn't we're still oh. we, we still have a load of stuff and actually it is going to be probably in two or three years' time, it's probably going to be the twentieth anniversary of that album, you know, that never got anywhere. So that's an auspicious occasion for us. <laughs> mm. So the song "No Party Atmosphere." Uh, when, from what period does that come from, then? That was about. I think it's probably about two thousand two, two thousand and three. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's kind of. I, I, I think it started from. Because uh, there's a recording at the front of there. There's a bit of there's a bit of um, sound recording of some genuine depressing party chatter at some kind of event <laughs> that I was at, and I think that's and I think that and the kind of what transpired after that was the was the was the inspiration for that <laughs> mm. <laughs> kind of catastrophic catastrophic <laughs> e evening of fun, you know. <laughs> and uh, so and I mean, it was and it's um. Yeah, I mean, you just at the time you do these things because you think it. You think I, I like, you know, you, there's a, some kind of inner compulsion that drives you to do it, and there's some inner voice that says this is right, and no, that's not right. This is right, and so you kind of follow it until you've completed a thing. But it's much more interesting looking back on it 15 years later, and uh, right, and um, and, and, all, and quite, and I and I still enjoy it. Yeah, it's a great track. So the song itself, then, it takes you from that kind of it's got a snarl about it the snarl is there from the beginning but it kind of gets more snarly as the song progresses until 
Well, a tiny hint of like she's not uh, she's so heavy by the Beatles towards the end of just a churning kind of dark and uh, menacing tone. It's rather delicious. Um, would you say Thank that's fair? Much. A little bit of Beatles. She's not heavy in there, and sort of uh, what other well, influences? Um, God, I think the I think probably um, the main influence around that time, if I'm honest, was probably a band called Weezer. And, um, ah. and uh, Weezer just do this great variety of kind of slacker rock where um, it's kind of rock, but without the chest, you know? It's <laughs> kind of big, heavy, slacker grooves, simple, essentially kind of emotionless on the surface, but actually seething underneath. But kind <laughs> yeah. of, um, you know, it, and, and there was just a great weight. And I think there was a, there was a song they had called The Sweater Song on that on the Blue album. And, um, and we just, and I stole a huge amount from that, you know, not least the ideas of offsetting the drum fills and rather than them having them at the eight, at the end of an eight bar section, having them at the beginning mm. of an eight bar section, so just <laughs> swapping nice. them a bar later, which was, which may well have been a mistake in the studio, who knows, but um, just mm. nick that anyway. <laughs> Great. Um, so um, let's let's rewind right back to, to to teenage to the teenage years. What was your first kind of musical kind of moment where you just felt that you were that's you wanted to be a musician? That's what you know. What was, I think what, probably what was um, the moment. There's two or three crucial things that happened. One of them was finding the the uh, the uh, Aladdin Sane album cover in my auntie's record collection I was just going through because I used to like looking at records and and uh, and I remember pulling out Aladdin Sane and just seeing this guy with the uh, with the lightning stripe on his face and uh, instantly thinking I don't know what's going on here but I like it you know this is yeah. this there's something about this this is great and another and that was the kind of that was the extent of that really for a long time I just I just remember that image I think the the, it was Talking Heads once in a lifetime when I was about 10 was the thing that actually kind of set my brain alight and made me want to go and start collecting tape recorders together and putting one sound on top of another sound. I think that was that was probably the one. Oh, nice. So then, uh, well, so, so from 10, you were kind of hooked then on the, that's the, the baby steps of production, music production. Yeah, yeah, I was just fascinated by the, by the uh, the ability at that point to do sound on sound recording was was it, you, it wasn't there, you know. I mean, even yeah. uh, you, I guess I guess I mean that. So I was ten. What was that? Seventy eight, seventy nine. Porter Studios were really expensive, and and I didn't even yeah. know about them anyway. There was no internet. There was no nothing. And the only way I could think of of kind of like, well, if I want to do that and then play something on top of it, I need to record it on that cassette thing then, play that. And then while that's going, I'll play on and I'll record it on that one. And oh, actually, I can do that wow. again, can't I? I can add a third thing on. And I sort of, so I taught myself <laughs> like and millions of people have oh. how to do basic sound on sound recording. And the day I got my first four track was, um, was, a, was a great day indeed. Oh, yeah. Which, one, which model did you get? Task, oh, oh, Task and Porter yeah. O2, yeah. Porter O2, yeah. yeah. And um, all these words like Q. Like, what, what's Q? <laughs> what's a Q? Mm. Uh, yeah. yeah. What, is a, what, is a Q? <laughs> what is a Q? What some, is a Q? What is a Q? Yeah. <laughs> it's, some, it's something they, they borrowed from snooker, but they've, they've, yeah. it's something that's come into the world of music via snooker. So that's good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, um, so you... I guess you started to songwrite, but also the idea of building tracks was there from the beginning then, as opposed to someone who writes a song and then lo learns about recording and multi-tracking. Um, yeah, so did yeah. you? I was always fascinated. Uh, do any of these tapes still exist? Um, I think there's, there's uh, yeah, there's one called The Monkey Song, which I think I've still got a cassette <laughs> copy of. Which Amazing. Was a song about my house being infested with monkeys. I, I, the thing <laughs> is, what 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 I've what I've discovered about a lot of my musical output over the years is that the process to me, in most um, on most occasions, was far more important than the content. So I didn't really care what the lyrics were or what the music was. It was more for me an exercise in in assembling it. 
a lot of the time. Sometimes I did, I, I did care very much, but a lot of the time I, I was just fascinated. I didn't care what the, what the end result was. I didn't care who was singing, what it sounded like, whether it was crap, whether it was good, whether it was cool. No comprehension of that. It was like, is that working? Can that go with that? Does that, you know, the process was, was, was always important to me and just the kind of, uh, I used to, I used to, my auntie used to have an electronic organ and I, and I used to play kind of Don't Cry For Me Argentina on it. And then there was a great moment when I'd pause and then bring the drums in with the beatbox, you know, and that was key for me. It's like the drums come in here and that's a moment, you know. <laughs> Those, those were interesting things. I'll take, I used to love tape recorders as well. Just the fact you could make a sound and then listen to it back. I found it all fascinating for some reason. Yeah, great. Um, so once you got, got into the 1980s and then sequencer technology and computer technology starting to emerge, was that something that you were interested in at all? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think the first sequencer I actually bought was a, a Roland Micro Composer, MC500. Um, which had kind of, you know, it looked like a little beige mini computer with telephone style kind of buttons on it and a, and a, a little kind of jog dial and a, and a very basic LCD display, you know, with MIDI in and MIDI out. And you played something on, on a keyboard into it and then you could play it back, you know, and you could actually edit it. And, um, yeah. and it was great because it was like having more me's. Like, great. <laughs> you wow. can do that and, and you it... can do that. So, yeah, and that was it. But I'd spend uh, okay. my time doing arrangements of, um, you know, that, the song Tigger sings in Winnie the Pooh, the wonderful thing about Tiggers, for example. <laughs> I would spend my time kind of doing arrangements of songs like that, you know, just because it was just an excuse to kind of figure out how everything worked. Yeah, great. Um, <laughs> so seeing these transitions then, these, these technological transitions, um, but also being a creative artist and... Um, what what have been kind of key things that when they've come out, for instance, that you've kind of latched onto and have given you, maybe have boosted your creativity? Um, I don't know, really. I, I mean, guitar pedals was a big thing for me. The, uh, yeah. uh, getting a delay pedal, for example. And these are all, right. these are all big moments yeah. when you're young and music equipment is yeah. expensive, you know. And um, anything that kind of anything that could make my tracks sound more professional, you know, because then you, you just could not achieve professional sounding results unless you went, unless no. you had people working for you who knew what they were doing and trained formally and you could, ex you could go into an expensive studio uh, and, and with a great deal of guidance, then you could come up with something that actually sounded like you might be able to hear it on the radio. You just could not get anything to sound professional. And um, that was a kind of, so anything that aided that process to me was a was a great thing, and um, and I moved up. You know, we, I remember my friend um, Damien used to have a Atari 1040 ST, we, and we used to run. You know, uh, eventually Cubase on there, and um, synced up with a little Fostex R8 reel to reel. And my my first studio had a 16 track half inch tape, and I had a little desk in there. But there was so much I didn't know about how to make mixes sound good and how to make recordings sound good. It was just kind of hearsay and little tidbits of things. And, you know, uh, egg boxes are the key to, you know, acoustic perfection at one point. It was a key, key bit of information. Yeah. So there was a lot of egg yeah. boxes purchased. And, um, and then kind of, I, I didn't, you know, a bit of frustration. I didn't, it didn't really seem to make a hum, huge amount of difference after all that effort. So, so and there was lots of things like that, you know, so you'd buy magazines. I think International Musician and Recording World was my magazine of choice, you know, and you just looked at these unfeasibly expensive things in there you could never afford to buy and, um, and just dreamt about it. Yeah. With the egg boxes, the things you meant to have the eggs still in the egg boxes. That's, the, that's where everyone went wrong. Oh, you were meant to bollocks. glue the eggs in there. And they had like special sonic resin, like the kind of egg slop would just kind of vibrate slightly and it would absorb That makes sense to me now. <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. So, um, that makes sense yeah. to me now. I mean, yeah, you'd have to really right. be careful not to break them at all, especially once they got a bit old. But, you know, I think maybe that's part partly where the popularity went. Um, sorry, digression. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so... That's, that's interesting. Sampling. Did, was sampling something that then excited you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I remember, um, I remember the, so I did eventually manage to buy a sampler. My first sampler was a Casio FZ-10M. And, um, oh, classic. And I think it, I think it had a, a kind of staggering two seconds, possibly, available <laughs> of sample time in it. 
if I remember right, right. which opened up a world of possibilities. But yeah, loads of floppy, floppy three and a half inch discs, or those ones, whatever they were. Um, yeah. And uh, and eventually, yeah, eventually, kind of the Akai stuff would come along, and I, yeah, I was mm. I was really into that, really into kind of looping and and working out how to get loops to sound good and uh, and that whole world really. And I remember, I mean, I remember that was all still relatively new when I kind of got to make my first first record. And um, we when we when we had to do little remixes of things, we I remember we'd hire Cyquest SCSI oh, drives, yeah. you know, yeah. to, to store the kind of, you know, up to kind of two or 300 megabytes of information that would be generated by these vast projects. And um, <laughs> it was amazingly kind of cumbersome. But well, I was always, I'm sure we were all just pushing and pushing and pushing to try and get more out of everything. What? I think that was the thing. I think you, you just learned to kind of squeeze everything you had and got the absolute most out of it that you could. You know, the opposite to now where it's just, you, there's, everything is yeah. possible and you just don't know where to start, you know. Uh, yeah, but I mean, that's quite interesting, isn't it? Because um, having those limitations and pushing against the limitations uh, brings forth a creativity that when you're kind of spoiled like we are today, maybe we don't, you know, we don't try to innovate so much because well, it's, we don't I think it's, it's easier to. to know. Yeah, it's easier to know when you've achieved all that you can achieve. You know, I mean, I would, I, I used to have a, a little Korg SR16 drum machine. You know, and um, and eventually, you 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 know all the different ways you can layer all the different sounds together, and all the different ways you can achieve any kind of accent and nuance in a pattern. So you know, okay, there's nothing more I can do there. It's now time to move mm. on. You know, and that's going to have to do. Yeah. So you move on to the next yeah. thing. And I think that kind of that 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 part of the process, in terms of, it's not necessarily great for how something sounds at the end, but I think it's great in terms of the creativity and kind of making the whole thing. You know. Mm. Yeah. Cool. So. Um in terms of uh, recording breakthroughs, when do you think you made your first properly commercial sounding recording? What, and, uh, and, and, and what was the kind of criteria for making it sound real? The first thing that, I remember the first demo that I made where I actually kind of thought, play hell, that sounds pretty good. And, it was, and the difference was I'd got a Roland R8 drum machine. Um, and uh, and that, for the time, had some really good sounds on it, and uh, and it had kind of you know for the time quite lifelike ride cymbals and 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 crash cymbals and things on it. And I made a, a kind of rock song. I didn't have a drummer. I, I I wasn't recording drums, but I made this thing with the R8, and and that that sounded great. But when I got my first um, proper recording deal, we got to build our own studio. So all of a sudden. I went from kind of my half inch 16 track and a little Studio Master desk to a 24 track a Studio A80 Mark, Mark II, I think, with 24 tracks of Dolby oh. SR, big console, Whoa. Load, of, a load of Neves, a Decker EQs, that, you know, one of which I've subsequently sold to Radiohead, you know, that now go for wow. 12 or 15,000 pounds a go. And I had all this Yikes. stuff because I had to, at that point there's some good people coming in to to suggest what might be good to me and uh, and uh so all of a sudden i got to a i got to an unusual My place goodness. where i made a big jump in equipment but not in understanding you know and uh <laughs> i wow. i thought that actually the the key to making a good record was to was to, is the more channels that you had in your mix and the more kind of effects and things that you used, the better your record would be i genuinely thought that for for, for a long time and um so so that didn't go well that whole that whole period. <laughs> well, wow. I learned, I start, but that's when I started learning. That's when I started learning about um, proper right. recording because all of a sudden I was working with people who knew what they were doing, and and for the first time I could start learning and start asking questions and start watching and and going, oh my god, right, I see. Well, that makes sense. And, Aha, okay, and great. And mm -hmm. oh right, okay, that's great. Let's put loads of tissue paper on the drum sticks. Let's double track it and all that kind of stuff. So. So all of a sudden, there was a brilliant kind of three or four year period where I, I, I was based over at Real World um, down the road here in Wiltshire. And, uh, and uh, all of a sudden, I was, I was working along, alongside some of the most talented people in the business and, and watching them yeah. and learning wow. from them. So, and that was absolutely brilliant. They, was, they were so lovely and tolerant of me, you know, <laughs> this loony from over the river who didn't have a clue. It was great. <laughs> and... Working at Real World would have exposed you to the most diverse amount of musical artists, I guess, coming through. 
uh, so the musical yeah, installation. It, it was a very exciting time to be at Real World because you'd get helicopters landing and and people like um you know Bill Gates walking around and uh, <laughs> and uh, wow. and then and then there'd be recording week and the, and they'd, it would look like um you know WOMAD basically you'd be in WOMAD um and all this stuff would be happening and all the studios would all of a sudden open their doors and everyone would be walking everywhere and doing everything with everyone and um. So that was that was absolutely yeah that was crazy from a you know from kind of growing up in a you know small town in the West Country to all of a sudden being in the middle of that was just brilliant absolutely brilliant yeah right so, I mean um, the contribution the real world and WOMAD have had is immeasurable I think it's just truly should never be forgotten I think uh, one of the things no. that struck me. Uh, was real world would on on the releases the that the the artwork would be beautiful amazing artwork rather than always presenting like a national geographic sort of front cover on things from music from all over the place it would be presented as contemporary art you yeah. know contemporary music yeah, yeah. um yeah, it was just it was just the same thing that you were doing, but from another part of the world. Like, this is how they do it, and this is how that's do it, and this is how these lot do it. When they all get together, and and that mixes with that, and that mixes with that, and it's just it doesn't matter, you know. Um, and it was yeah, the the people. I mean, that's that's the thing from from literally a kind of shift of ten miles down the road, and kind of uh, <laughs> you know being in one studio and then being in another. The 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 world the world I was in was entirely different to what I'd been used to and entirely the one I, I very much wanted to be in with that was populated <laughs> in very close proximity of a lot of people who were absolute heroes and you see them wow. and they were having a cup of tea over there you know <laughs> it's crazy <laughs> yeah fantastic um so did you feel then you were moving more to being a producer engineer studio guy than a musician or did you always try to balance the two well, I've always, I've always, um, I've never, I've always been more of a studio guy and more of a mixer and producer guy, and I've learned, I've learned how to play to a certain standard just simply in order to get stuff done because I just needed to get stuff done. So if I need to get a bass part down, I just, I just wanted to be able to pick up the bass and play it, you know. And half the time, um, half the time, it's just quicker than to try and to to do it yourself than to try and explain. To somebody else, it's not necessarily not necessarily in terms of technique because I know for a fact that I couldn't sit down at a drum kit and just and just play the most um, beautiful kind of you know rudiment infused Steve Gadd style kind of perfection and <laughs> especially over over anything more than a bar. But um, but uh, having said that, a lot of the what I was interested in again was rock and and uh, and punk and that kind of stuff. And actually, it's quite difficult sometimes to get uh, uh, someone that's a, a really a really kind of accomplished musician to go down 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 in a way that's <laughs> actually convincing, you know. So so um, and that was a lot of the, a lot. So I didn't mind my work being rough around the edges. And so I'd learned I learned to play the guitar a bit. I learned how to play a bit of, a bit of a piano I'm terrible and but you know by that at that stage I mean even though we were working on tape I could still edit my performances you know and get the thing down and I used to get we used to get players in when when quality was needed you get it rent it <laughs> always get them in you know get a player right, in. Wow. it's always an, it's always just an education you know and awe inspiring a real player is uh, quite something so in terms of your songwriting then and uh are you influenced by other people's songs with the people that you work with? Does that then feed into your own influences? I, I always, yeah, I always found it much better working with other people. So um, quite often someone would play me something and I would just think, okay, stop, that, that's great. You know, let's, let's try this or let, have you thought about this and maybe we should change that lyric to that and then, oh, I, you know, have an idea for a whole new session, uh, section. So I always and prefer working with other people. I think that's, uh, I think that's always, always better as a rule. Mm. Every now and again, you mm. come up with something. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm quite similar, I think. Uh, so moving into, the, into current times and... I mean, obviously, pandemic aside, recently you've been involved in a David Bowie tribute act and one of the <laughs> yeah. premium David Bowie tri I can't believe what I've seen. So the Bowie Collective, uh, this is an enormously ambitious project and this, is your, this was your, your baby, I guess. 
Is that right? Well, it was. It was. Um, it started off. Um, it, the, it, it's a funny thing with the Bowie Collective because it basically it started with a phone call with me and uh, and Jerry, um, our guitar player. You know, just after after David's death, and uh, and we were chatting on the phone about about it, and we thought, oh, you know, like, I think I think what would be great was. Why don't we just use this as an excuse to have a get together? And why don't we get together in the Crown down at Bath Ford and get a few Herberts along, and we'll just play some Bowie songs? That'd be a laugh, you know. It'd be a nice way to mark the occasion. And um, so we thought we'd do that. And um, and then someone said, "Oh, okay, that's great." Um, you know, that, uh, one of our one of our kind of um, friends or families had a bit of uh, a bit of bad luck. So so we thought, oh, I know what we could do is we could use this as a, a little fundraising exercise. What we could put a fiver on the door or whatever, and then and then help help out these guys, you know. And so we did that. And then all of a sudden, it became clear that the pub was going to be too small. Um, so uh, oh, okay, now what we're going to do? So we so then we sort of made a jump. And this and this is kind of key to the pattern of the Bowie Collective. We then decided to rent Comedia, you know, rather than get a bigger pub. We thought, well, let's rent Comedia then, you know, and then immediately kind of right. put pressure on ourselves. So it just grew, and um, and then we got in more into the costumes because originally I was just saying, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to be in a tribute band. No, thanks, <laughs> you know. And then, right, um, right. and then it eventually it was like, listen, you're going to have to put a wig on, man. It's like they come in their Bowie songs. Just bung our <laughs> suit on and a wig. It's like, oh god, you know. So so I did that, and and it was quite it was quite good fun, you know. Fifth, but David Bowie, age 50, was something I thought, OK, well, it, maybe I can do that. And anyway, <laughs> it, 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 it grew. It grew out of, uh, out of all proportion quite quickly. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, I mean, did you, I mean, was it a surprise that you could inhabit that sphere as convincingly? Uh, did you used to do impressions of him when you were young? Or, I mean, it, it, it's, it's just no, remarkable. I See, didn't. No, no, I right. didn't. And what would happen? I'd, I'd, in, with, you know, we'd record, we'd record songs. We'd be in the studio doing girl stuff, and, uh, and I'd kind of go in and do a vocal, you know, and um, <laughs> I'd come out and, you know, you know uh, how's that? And they go, well, yeah, it's right. It's a bit, bit Bowie-ish, you know. Uh. I go, oh, um, okay. Well, I'll try and do it not like that then, you know. And um, so that was a kind of, I, I just, because I, you know, eventually having kind of discovered the Aladdin Sane album cover at age six mm. or seven or whatever it was when I first found it. I then um, I then really got into the music later on in a very 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 big way. So I've just I'm mm. the, I'm a massive Bowie fan. You know I don't like everything he's done, but I like a lot of what he's done. And so I think that just kind of his whole approach and the whole kind of reaching out to other areas of creativity outside of sound, you know, was was always something I found good fun. So I think I just yeah I just you know in um, just absorbed. A lot of bowiness, you know, and he he came to kind of embody what I thought a good pop sh pop star should be. I also really liked Prince, but um, I think it was more natural that I should be more of a Bowie than more of a Prince because I've never <laughs> been able to do the splits, for example. And there's something about <laughs> Prince that I I don't think I could I could pull off. You know, I can just about pull off a certain a certain bit of bowiness under the right light with a with a good crew backing me up. But um, <laughs> that, that's how that happened, really. How is that going to affect you doing any sort of future gigs? Non, uh, you've kind of raised the the game a little bit for everything that you do going <laughs> forward now, though, haven't you? <laughs> oh no, I've always I've always done that. Always a bit off, bit off more than I can more than I can chew. But um, you know, that's just uh, I think sometimes you've just got to kind of go for it a bit, really, and uh, because otherwise you, it, 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 you know, if you're not gonna if you're not gonna get there, it's better to find out find out sooner rather than later. I think, and then you kind of you, know, you can go after something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so just returning finally to the song, um... based on some of the things we were talking about earlier, I think that the the that no party atmosphere is a kind of a good example yeah. where there's been yeah. a, there's an idea there's a core idea that that we've had or that I've had and a little story that that um I wanted to tell somehow and it's a, a description of a description of kind of some things and then also uh, it's the, in a way there's not much in the way of songwriting there in in, in one way because it's kind of just a, 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 just a riff on an idea and it's really just a kind of a poem you know set to a, mm. a, a, a repeating chord pattern but 
as ever, I think my kind of interest in, in the production process and the sonic process was, was again, a, a big part of that song because I just wanted it to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger until it broke. Yes. And, um, yeah. and so and I, I wanted to start off with literally a, a single guitar and nothing and gradually to bring in elements. And then, and then just when you think the, the guitars are kind of, you know, quite chunky, a new set of guitars comes in that, that made them sound puny by comparison. And then, <laughs> and then 16 yeah. bars later, another one that comes in and does the same thing. And, and of course, in fact, that's an unsustainable kind of, um, kind of process, but it was interesting yeah. to try and get away with it as much as possible. And, and a good exercise in kind of bringing stuff down in the mix and bringing other stuff in and leaving room for more things to come in, like the backing vocals and the, the guitars that were going off through the synths and just all the kind of mayhem and deconstruction yeah. that happened at the end. So, so it was a kind of, that, I think that's why that song is dear to me because it encapsulates a lot of the kind of um, ideas and things and, and head scratching problem solving that goes on in just creating a little kind of encapsulated kind of concept. And it's a, to me, it's just like a little film. It just hasn't got any pictures on it, that's all. Ah, bingo! That was the one. That was the one. That was that was that was the question. That was the answer to the question I couldn't find. That was absolutely <laughs> perfect. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, it's nice to talk about it. It's nice to chat about yeah. it. I've got to say. Yeah, well, it's, it's it's amazing, and it's an earworm as well. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to have to spend the rest of the day trying to sort of get the toilet brush on the kind of. Uh, no. Um, it's um it's an interesting <laughs> I I, one because it's i mean on the on the on the record you know it sounds very different to everything else that's on there and it's and it kind of in a way it sounds a bit quieter and hasn't got as much bass on it and all the rest of it is but it's from a different time and it does it and it does a different sort of job in a way but it's as a world yeah. in of and you know unto itself it it's it's fine mm. i think you know you just have to kind of get into it yeah definitely i mean we just uh we're trying to figure out with the compilation um What's the best way to do it? Because the tracks are just never going to... Uh, you can't really sequence them particularly in any way that will make it like a smooth playlist. Um, so we're wondering about whether people should just... Whether they should all be um, however the artist wants it to be and not sort of do any mastering on it. They let anyone just go, that's how it is, that's how it is, that's how it is. Rather than try yeah. and rather than try and bring them up and mm, kind of make them sound somehow compatible with each other, <laughs> it's a very bizarre, exactly bizarre yeah. process. Well, I think it's a, it's a yeah it's a you know it's a it's just a, a an eclectic collection, isn't it, of of people that have a common thread, you know, and um, yeah. so that that in itself is is interesting. But um, yeah, yeah I thought people were just kind of dis going to dip in, I guess. But um, but, I, but but having said that, it's it, I wouldn't be at all offended if you if you put it last because <laughs> it's got because <laughs> it's got a great outro. Actually, <laughs> and, you know, no one it's wants not to sit through, No one wants to sit through that. You know what I mean? So um, I put it last on yeah. our record when we did it. <laughs> so it's fine. Okay, interesting. Okay, that's not bad. It's, it, yeah. it does work in that respect. Um, well, it saves but, anyone else being offended by being put last <laughs> on the record. <laughs> So did, did you have a did you manage to have a listen to some of the other tracks? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, yeah, mm, yeah just and um, it's, it's just a wild variety of of, <laughs> of stuff on there. And um, I is. think your, I think Gaz, yours yours was uh, another one that had more of a song. It was yes. not a lot of not a lot of them not a lot in the way of songs on there. No, Lots of pieces. Uh, Lots Mark of pieces. Uh, Mark uh, Mark Tinley's one uh, is a. It's a odd song. I like it. It's really yeah. strange. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's it. That's, that's good. He's just uh, and Mark Doty as well. Um, his song. His song is. Uh, I, I was wondering if about making little islands, you know, and sort of um, like I think our songs could be on a little island together, you know, the, the, um, and then separate, you know, mm. group things together is a little little things separate that's I, not a bad idea actually so little chunks yeah movements little chunks if you yeah like almost like a collection of eps you know of um so because yeah. if you uh, but i don't know that people are going to necessarily put it on and play it all the way through although it would be nice if they do so if they do that how to 
curate that journey that it sort of uh that kind of works um but i quite like a little dirty snotty the kids on the back seat of the bus at the end of the album and uh, you know we and we can all go for a crafty little fag at the back of the of the bus yeah. and <laughs> sort of vibe yeah <laughs> i'm up for that <laughs> uh, so it could be I could see that shape working you know and it's uh, only for those who want to dare kind of plunder the depths you know and you know who, who's if hard you, enough to make it, it to far. the back of the bus yes yeah, <laughs> yeah. if you've made oh, it this works. far we might as well go to this might as well go to a crap party <laughs> <laughs> yeah and I tell you what, because of me, the badasses I could, I could lower everyone else's tracks by 10 dB before ours <laughs> as well there you go so then it's just so... Rah!